It is my privilege to introduce our speaker, presenter tonight. Marquise Laughlin is the founder of Acts of the Word Ministries, a nonprofit, non denominational ministry dedicated to transforming people's lives through the words of the Bible. As a performance artist, theologian, and missionary to the church in America, his uniquely compelling dramatic solo scripture presentations include seven differing books of the Bible, highlighting the epic story of God's relationship with man. He maintains an active touring schedule all over the world, and his passion is to inspire audiences to act out the words that they hear. All of Marquis's scripture presentations are dedicated to bringing the good news of the gospel and relief to the world's poorest children. Marquise is also the producer and host of the nationally syndicated radio talk show and social media platform called The Moral Dilemma, currently airing on 200 plus stations. He and his wife, Teresa, have three young children and live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area. Would you please join me in welcoming Marquise Laughlin to chapel this evening? In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. See, in Him was life. And that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Now there came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. Now he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and yet his own did not receive him. But to all who received him, to everyone who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. See, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, from the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but... God, the one and only who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord's feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters, they sent word to Jesus. Lord, the one you love is sick. Now when Jesus heard this, he said, this sickness will not end in death. 
No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they replied, a, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you and yet you're going back there? But Jesus replied, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I am going there to wake him up. But Lord, his disciples said, if he sleeps, he, he will get better. His disciples thought he meant natural sleep, but Jesus had been speaking to them about his death. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad I was not there for your sake, so that you may believe. But come, let us go to him. Then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us go also that we may die with him. Now on his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus had come, she went out to meet him. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Well, I know he will rise again, said Martha, in the resurrection at the last day. Then Jesus declared, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who was to come into the world. And having said this, she then ran and called her sister Mary. Well, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she fell at his feet weeping. Lord, she said, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Once more deeply moved, he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone rolled in front of the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by now there is a strong odor for he has been there for four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked toward heaven and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you have sent me. Now having said this, he then called in a loud voice toward the tomb. Lazarus! Come out! The dead man came out! his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. <laughs> Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and her sister Martha and had seen what Jesus did, they put their faith in him. But some of them went to the chief priest and the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priest and the Pharisees they called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, they asked. 
Here is this man performing many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, well, the whole world will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and they'll take away both our place and our nation. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all, he said. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. Now, he did not say this on his own. As high priest said here, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for the Jewish nation, but also for the scattered children of God. To bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Now, when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover feast, many people went up to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. Six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. <laughs> Now, meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there, and they came. Well, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest and the Pharisees said to one another, <sighs> they made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus. Now, the next day, the large crowd that uh, had, uh, had come to Jerusalem, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. So the chief priest and the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now, it was just before the Jewish Passover feast. Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and return to the Father. Having loved his own, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the evening meal, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and he poured water into a basin, and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. But Lord, Simon Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus said to him, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then Simon Peter replied, well then, Lord, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. <laughs> Jesus answered him, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet, for you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing his disciples' feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Well, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example as you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. 
I'm not speaking of all of you. I know those whom I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the scriptures. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I'm telling you this before it happens so that when it does happen, you will know that I am he. And after Jesus had said these things, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled and testified, I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of the disciples, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said to him, ask him which one he means. Then leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered him, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. As soon as Judas took the bread, he went out and it was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, he will glorify himself in the Son, and he will glorify him at once. My little children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me. And just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered him, where I am going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. But Simon Peter replied, but Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered him, Will you really lay down your life for me? I tell you the truth. Before the rooster crows, you will disown me. Three times. But do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house there are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Then Philip said to him, The oh Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. <laughs> Jesus answered him, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you for such a long time? Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on the evidence of the miracles themselves. Now, if you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father to send you another counselor to be with you forever the spirit of truth. Though the world does not know him, you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
Now before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. And because I live, you also will live. See, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. I am the true vine. My Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, every branch that bears fruit, he prunes so that it will become even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the words I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If anyone remains in me, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, if you obey my command, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's command and remain in his love. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. In a little while, you will see me no longer. And then, <laughs> after a little while, you will see me. Some of his disciples began to ask one another, what does he mean by saying, in a little while you will see me no longer than after a little while you will see me? And because I'm going to the Father, we don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this. So he said to them, are you asking one another what I meant when I said in a little while you will see me no longer and then after a little while you will see me? I tell you the truth, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. But when her child is born, she forgets her anguish because of her joy that a baby is born into the world. So with you, now is your time of grief, but I will see you again, and you will rejoice, and no one will take away your joy. You see, I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you're speaking clearly. <laughs> and without figures of speech, I mean, now we can see that you know all things. And that you don't even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. You believe at last, Jesus said. <laughs> but a time is coming and has now come when you will all be scattered, each to his own home. You will leave me all alone. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And after Jesus had said these things, he looked toward heaven and he prayed. Father, the time has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people to give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you the only true God 
and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I brought you glory on earth by completing the work you've given me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I've made you known to those you gave me out of the world. For I gave them the word you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. And I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one even as we are one. I pray not only for them, but for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you have loved them, even as you have loved me. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them. And that I myself may be in them. When he had finished praying, he left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. Now on the other side, there was an olive grove, and he and his disciples went into it. Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas came to the grove, guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and Pharisees. They, they were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. Jesus, knowing all that was about to happen to him, went out and said to them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I am he, said Jesus. And Judas the traitor was standing there with them. Now when Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I told you that I am he, said Jesus. Since you are looking for me, then let these men go. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus said to Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers and their officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the people that it would be good if one man died for the people. Now, Simon Peter and another disciple, who was known to the high priest, were, were following Jesus. Since this disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the high priest's courtyard. But Simon Peter had to wait outside at the door. So then the disciple who was known to the high priest went back, spoke to the girl on duty there, and brought Peter in. You're not one of his disciples, are you? The girl at the door asked Peter. He denied it, saying, I am not. It was cold, and the servants stood around a fire that they had made to keep warm. Simon Peter was also standing there with him, warming himself. Now meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I spoke openly to the world, Jesus replied. I was taught at the temple or at the synagogues where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. Now when Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby struck him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why 
do you strike me? Then Annas sent him still bound to, uh, then Caiaphas sent him still bound to Annas, the high priest. Now meanwhile, as Simon Peter stood warming himself, he was asked again. You're not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. Another man, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the olive grove? Again, he denied it. And at that moment, a rooster crowed. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. Now, by now, it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, the Jews did not want to enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them. What charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Well, take him yourselves, Pilate said, and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. See, this happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. So then Pilate went back inside the palace and questioned Jesus. Are you the king of the Jews, Pilate asked? Is that your own idea, said Jesus, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priest who handed you over to me. What is it you've done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king then, said Pilate. You are right in saying that I am a king, said Jesus. In fact, for this reason I was born, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. <laughs> what is truth? <laughs> and with this he went out again and said to them, look, I find no basis for charges against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner during the time of the Jewish Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? But they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in a rebellion. So Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Ha! And they struck him in the face. Now once more, Pilate came out and said to them, Look, I'm bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for charges against him. Now, when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. But they shouted back, take him away, take him away, crucify him. You take him and crucify him, Pilate replied. As for me, I find no basis for charges against him. But we have a law, the Jews objected. And according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid. And he went back inside the palace and questioned Jesus. Where do you come from? Pilate asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate replied. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the ones who handed you over to me are guilty of a greater sin. 
Now from then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you're no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. Now when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and he sat down at a place known as the stone pavement, the judge's seat. It was the day of preparation, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted back, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate replied? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place known as the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. And here, they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side, and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Near the cross of Jesus stood Jesus' mother, Mary, the wife of Clopas, his mother's sister, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to his mother dear woman here is your son and to the disciple here is your mother From that day on, this disciple took her into his home. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was nearby, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, he said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head. and gave up his spirit. Now the day in which Jesus was crucified was to be a special Sabbath because the Jews did not want the bodies left on the crosses during the Sabbath. They asked Pilate for permission to have the legs broken and the bodies taken down. The soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man who'd been crucified with Jesus and then those of the other. But when they came to Jesus, and found that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers took a spear and pierced Jesus' side, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. See, these things happened so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. Not one of his bones would be broken. And as another scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Now later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for permission to have the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who had visited Jesus earlier at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it in the spices with the strips of linen. This is in accordance with Jewish burial customs. 
Now, near the cross of Jesus, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been placed, because it was the day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Now, very early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene got up and went to the tomb. And she saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they put him. So Simon Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked inside, but did not go in. Finally, Simon Peter arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had arrived first went inside. He saw and believed. Now, the disciples still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So then the disciples went back to their homes. Now, later, on that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said to them. Then he showed them his nail-pierced hands and his wounded side. Again he said to them, Peace be with you. (laughs) Now the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. (laughs) Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Now a week later, the disciples were gathered again. And this time Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you, he said to them. Then he said to Thomas, See my hands? Put your finger here. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, And my God, Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Jesus did many other miraculous signs and wonders that are not recorded in this book. I suppose if every one of them written down, there would not be enough room in the whole world for the books that would be written. But these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life. In his name. Amen.